Hi everyone, I'm Erik. This is my colleague Pelle. We're going to talk about teams, tools and processes. And just to cover sort of a flyover, we're going to do a fair share of architecture. We are going to talk about how to optimize the architecture. Uh, we're going to talk about the teams. That's something we promised. And we have the infra team, the data consumer team, that's the C. And the data producer teams, that's the P. And we do have a bunch of tools that's also promised. So we're going to talk about tools. This is us. I'm Eric. I'm on this side. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's the right side. Uh, I'm a senior data engineer, that's what I call myself, at least. Six years at Klarna. I did a PhD in database technology first, uh, before. Pelle. Yeah, so Eric actually hired me five years ago. Uh, I'm a Java lead developer for our big data infra teams. Uh, and I've been in fintech for about 10 years, working at Nasdaq, OMX, uh, different banks, stuff like that. Right. So apart from me and Pelle, who are on the stage, I think we are about 10 additional people running the entire data infrastructure for Klarna. So you can definitely call this a bare-bones skeleton operations with uh, rather small teams, considering the amount of data we have and the amount of analysis we perform. So how can we actually make, keep afloat, given this big operation and this uh, small number of personnel? Uh, well, first, just an introduction on what we run. Obviously, we run Hadoop, and we do run Hive, a lot of Hive, actually. 99% of our analysis is Hive. We have a bunch of data sources. How many is it? Is it 100? I think it's 200. OK, basically. 200 and counting. We get more data sources every week. Someone mentioned Kafka, and I think we add about one to two topics a week to the cluster. So we have Kafka topics, we have relational databases, we have cloud sources, we have internet sources, what have you. These all land on the left-hand side of the distributed file system of Hadoop. And then we are running transformations. <coughs> transformations are typically owned not by ourselves in the data infra, but by the data consumers. We're going to talk more about those in a bit. Um, so results of the transformations, they end up on the right-hand side of the Hadoop distributed file system. Some of these result data sets are being exported to other systems that facilitate lookup, including uh, these mission-critical systems for Klarna. Had, has anyone here been, been using Klarna? Yeah, some of you have. I'm glad to see that. So then you have been interacting with Klarna Checkout, most likely. Klarna Checkout, in, in, in turn, does use a, bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of Klarna internal services, including the ID service, essentially giving answer to the question, who are you? And then the next service is uh, uh, answering the question, is that really you? And that's the fraud service. And the next service is the risk service, answering the question, what's the probability that you, that you eventually will pay us? OK, these services need to be able to respond within sub-second. So um, we have rather high demands on what kind of data, how the data is organized, and all that on the right-hand side uh, outside Hadoop. So that's a serving layer, if you like. In addition to these machine users, we also have human users. Here's an analyst. And she's actually, look at the screen, she's actually looking at the yellow arrow here. She's trying to make a blue arrow here instead and figure out, is the blue arrow smarter than the yellow arrow? Um, so this sort of gives you the, um, the picture. What, what kind of stuff do we do with the data, and how does the architecture look like? Some fun facts. We have been in production for five years, a bunch of petabytes of storage. We never lost data. We never had unplanned downtime. That's rather fantastic. And this is Hadoop. We have a bunch of human users, we have a bunch of machine users, 9,000 Hive databases and counting. We're going to talk more about that in a bit. And a bunch of CPU hours are spent per day. Um, <coughs> overall, we still adhere to the Lambda architecture. Anybody heard about the Lambda architecture? Yeah, it's sort of a conservative uh, approach. But the nice thing is that all data are landing as is on the left-hand side of the distributed file system. And then each transformation is a function of all data. Um, <coughs> so everything is recomputed from scratch every time we apply it. And Pelle is going to talk about how to optimize this So, um, in order to, to avoid being stupid. Why do we do this? 
Well, because it's easier to express a transformation that recomputes everything from scratch than to express a transformation that tries to be smart and tries to be incremental. Um, and if you give an analyst something that is easier to express, then the analyst is, um, is likely to do less errors. So this has served us well during the past five years. Another super powerful feature of the Lambda architecture is the fact that you can maintain several versions of the same transformation at the same time. At the top you have the version, um, the transformation F, version 1.0. And then you decide that mm, I want to release and deploy a blue transformation. I'm going to call this the, version, the, the transformation F version 1.1. And then I can actually do comparisons of the output data set, compare the gray database to the blue database. And I can do this for any number of versions running simultaneously over the same input data set. So I facilitate full comparability here which is rather fantastic. Now over to Pelle. Right, so Lambda says you should uh, recompute everything every time. Uh, and as uh, Eric says, that sounds a bit stupid. It's a very good uh, thing to try to be true to, but we noticed that uh, data processing can, can sort of happen in, in three stages. We have first data coming in, and on that one we can do linear projections meaning basically applying a pure function to each row of the data set or each event, if you like. Uh, this is highly, this is very easy to make incremental because the, it's basically just applying functions to the top of a log all the time. So that one can be made incremental. Then we have something we call single source aggregation. That means basically doing velocity count on a log or maybe do session aggregates on a single log. Uh, that's also pretty easy to to, do, to make incremental by applying some sort of windowing function. And then we have general data processing, uh, which basically is a function of all data. I want to join everything with everything. That's not really easy to optimize. But by doing these uh, two steps before, you can have this step optimized by uh, producing nice uh, file formats and nice schemas, nice queryability. So by applying these three dip different strategies, uh, we can optimize the Lambda architecture and still be able to do function of all data. All these steps can be recomputed at any time, if we want to, at the CPU and, and the latency cost, of course. Uh, so basically, we can see that incrementality is, is, is much bigger in, on the left side, and, and it sort of dwindles on the right side. Sorry, left side dwindles on the right side. So here you have huge gains of, of um, optimizing with incremental processing. Another problem we had, uh, we, we've been, ha been having this for five years, I think someone said five years ago, loading is the hardest part of big data. Crossing system boundaries is really hard. I have a big data computation system, I have my big result set, and I now I want it up in the cloud. That's really hard to do. It's still one of our biggest problems and where we spend most of our time trying to figure out new solutions. Uh, so, so basically the pink one here being our data vault, one system, the turquoise one being another system. Getting data to that system is hard. One approach is to sort of build some sort of a transaction log. There's uh, products out there called like bottled water, uh, golden gate, stuff like that. Basically they do change data capture, uh, so you just ship what has changed. Uh, since we produce full batches every day, we don't really know what has changed. There's no change log. But given that you can take yesterday's result and today's result, you can calculate a change. So basically, we synthesize a transaction log and we ship that one on Kafka. Someone wanted to hear Kafka again. Um, we ship that one on Kafka and the consumer on the other side can read that and sort of keep their data set up to date. Still. Uh, the Kafka contains the full data set or the full snapshot of the current data set, the current batch, so you can always recompute from the beginning. The consumer can al always read from the Kafka and get all data. Uh, yeah. Right. So we also promised talking about teams. So if we revisit this overall architecture that we talked about in the beginning, we can see we had the um, Hadoop cluster in the middle, we had the data producers on the left-hand side and the data consumers on the uh, right-hand side. And we already said the infra team is less than a dozen people. 
Um, <clears throat> so let's reason about how the producers, the infra and the consumers do interact with each other because this, this is some kind of management lessons learned during the past few years, I think. And now I'll leave it up to Pelle again. Yeah, so five years ago when we started to, to, to set this up, we pretty fast figured out uh, to be able to run this on a skeleton crew, we will not deal with any domain knowledge around the data. So the infra team has, is, is uh, I, I would like to say, totally dom domain agnostic. Of course it isn't, but as domain agnostic as possible. So we leave the domain to producers and consumers. Uh, <coughs> that means consumer data needs will drive the quality of the produced data. Consumers goes directly to the producer and says, hey, I need this data, but I need it in a better format because I'm doing this and that. That forces actually also the producers to understand the sort of hidden API of big data. Their API is their data. This is usually a conflict Produces, um, if you produce a microservice, you don't see your data as your API, basically. That's just something flowing under the system somewhere to some other place. But this basically forces the producers to actually take charge of their data as part of their public API of their service. So, but we need to help them with this because, as I said, it's a conflict. It doesn't happen. We, we need to tell the producers, you are a data producer. Uh, and this is your customer, the, the consumer. And we do this by, by, by pushing them uh, in that direction, documentation, stuff like that. So basically, a consumer would ask a producer, what does this field mean? This is a, uh, we, we're going to go through a couple of scenarios here. So, so if a consumer un wants to know, understand stuff about the data, he always goes to the producer. If he wants to know why the job crashes, he goes to the infra team. Uh, and if we don't want to help him because uh, he's asking this question a lot, we document it or build a tool to help him understand this. We want this to be as self-service as possible. We also had this nice, um, what has grown through the years is that, that this has become some sort of consumer community at Klarna. We have the Slack channel where we try to force everyone to, to ask their questions. And these days, around 70 to 80 percent of the questions asked there is asked by beginners uh, on this infrastructure and also answered by sort of the power users of this infrastructure. So we only actually have to deal with like 20% of the actual questions around uh, our own infrastructure. So I think we, we have like 180 or so persons in this Slack community and it's sort of, yeah, 80% is self-serving. It's yeah. fantastic. Another scenario is uh, the consumer saying, hey, I want your data. Then the producer will say to us, could you please ingest our data? Uh, and then we will provide back to the consumer the processing power to, to work with this data. <coughs> the way we do this is that uh, we provide standard ways to ingest data into the data vault. So by uh, a configuration, you can say, uh, as, a, as a producer, you say, hey, ingest my topic or my database. Uh, and on the right hand side, we say to the consumer, use this, uh, this package that we provide for you to describe the logic you want to run, and we will sort the rest out for you. Boom. Yes, over to Eric. Let's talk about high level transformation packaging. Um, did anyone use that before? <laughs> no, because this is an internal Klarna product. Uh, so essentially, what we do is um, empower the analyst to do. Uh, all these software engineering like uh, tasks themselves. So they are able to query data sources, they are able to explore data, create schedule, deploy data pipelines, consume results, all that in a traceable, testable, scalable way uh, with almost zero involvement from the data infra team. So think about how many man hours or man years this has been saving us because we have avoided 99% of hand-holding by providing this, this kind of framework. So on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see that, well, we uh, include all the tooling, the scheduling, the versioning, the continuous deployment pipelines, all that is included in high-level transformation packaging so that we basically take away all the software engineering practice uh, from the analysts, so they don't have to worry about that. They get the transformations executed on a regular basis. They get the data dependencies for free. 
and they also get the versioning. So they will always be able to go back and have traceability. Why did this and this decision happen? Well, because you were running version 132 of your transformation at that time. And we know that because of the log files and the um, continuous delivery pipeline. So this gives us the traceability that any bank would need. So <coughs> once an HLTP job has finished, it will end up as a Hive database. And next time around, the next day, so this is March 20, I guess. March 21, there's another Hive database. And March 22, there's another Hive database. So this is the explanation why we have 9,000 Hive databases and counting. Of course, we need to introduce some retention as well, because we cannot have an infinite number of Hive databases. But at the same time, Hive databases are very cheap compared to engineer time, so why not sprinkle them around you like confetti? It works. And uh, yeah, so that was my job. And then there's their job. And then uh, there is 200 other teams' Hive databases around, adding up to 9,000 or so. Um, <coughs> so then the natural question to ask is, of course, hmm, how do I keep track of all of this? And how do I make sure I'm querying the right database? The answer is, as usual, tooling. We provide another tool. In this case, we have a named dataset discovery. Out of all these databases with my job version 101, which one should I take? The named dataset discovery tool does the job for you. So basically what we have been providing for them is the HLTP, the dataset discovery. We also provide a testing framework for Hive queries. So you don't have to test all your queries in production and three hours later figure out that, hmm, there was a bug in my query. You can actually unit test away a lot of errors in your Hive code. So again, this is all about empowering the data consumers or analysts to do as much work uh, <coughs> uh, on their own as possible. And then, well, yeah, it gets even more interesting. <coughs> so we have a bunch of analysts, and they are running stuff, and suddenly it takes three times longer than usual. Or we have a data producer that discovers that the JSON cannot be queried anymore, or that mission-critical fraud transformation, it actually fails and, and uh, goes belly up. Um, so um, we realized that we need to introduce some professional services here from the data infra team. So currently, we are two data engineers helping out with uh, fringe cases like this that are really hairy and, and possibly also critical for the business. Um, we also uh, built some tooling for us to enable proactivity. Um, and that way we can discover that hmm, we actually have 40 analysts that are querying a certain data source in a suboptimal way. So now we can actually uh, try to group them together and, and help them be smarter. And this is really cheesy, but we call it proactive professional services. Um, Okay, yeah, and, uh, one last thing, I think. Uh, so let's say we, we managed to reduce the CPU consumption with uh, almost, done to almost nothing. I mean, th that happened last week, and it happened a month ago, and it will happen again. But the question is then from the analyst, can he trust the optimizations we propose? Enter tooling. We made a tool called Diftong that is able to compare one Hive database with another Hive database. And remember, this is big data, so this might be a few terabytes, actually, that we need to compare row by row, number by number, cell by cell. Uh, so you need to pay special attention, obviously, and respect scalability and complexity when you do this. Um, but this, this is another tool that, is, uh, that has shown to be super powerful. Okay. All right, so this is the final slide. Um, and that's good, because I have one minute. Uh, but and so you say Hadoop is an ecosystem, right? Both of these are ecosystems. Uh, we are trying to keep ourselves and our customers on the nice planet and not on the chaos planet. We realize every day to let people in on the full Hadoop experience might not be an awesome experience for anyone. So that's why we sort of shield and abstract away the hard parts of Hadoop to, to just let analysts live where analysts wants to live, basically. And thanks for that. Questions? Thank you very much.
I'm afraid we've uh, used up the time slot, so no time for questions. I'm sure you will be around for some. I found this very interesting because I built the corresponding infrastructure at Spotify, and it's interesting to see the, the similarities and the differences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.